This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Success Stories is a program that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. And Dean Eric Inlow, my guest today, is one such person. Dean Inlow is Dean of Handong International Law School in South Korea, and he's also a Vice President of Handong University. Dean Inlow, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to, want to ask you about Handong. If you could talk about the law school. I think it just had its 20th anniversary and, and talk about what it is, what its identity is, and how you got there. Yeah. Uh, well, Handong International Law School is a, uh, was originally a project of both a vision and entrepreneurship in a way. Um, it's a very unique school in the sense that we teach U.S. and international law in Asia. And our students uh, are focusing on preparing for careers in uh, international law in the sense of helping businesses to connect with, with trade, uh, but also on the, the public international law side, dealing with human rights issues and, and problems that people face with, with governments and religious freedom and, and other kinds of things. And uh, the idea really came out of uh, the passion of the, the first president in two senses. One, uh, as a Christian school, a, a passion to, to help Christians in other countries that were struggling with religious freedom and other kinds of, of problems. Uh, but also just the, the notion that uh, we need to, as, as Christians, be, be taking the kingship of, of Christ into to all the world and a kind of entrepreneurial vision where he said, look, there's a, there's a real opportunity to do something that hasn't ever been done, and we should try to do it. And th that's really the history of, of the law school. Uh, once we, we tried this thing and, and tried this endeavor, uh, we identified a, a real need, and uh, it, was, it was real scary to do it because it hadn't been, hadn't been done. But, but once we did it, everybody looked around and said, hey, this is great. And in the last 20 years, our, our school went obviously from, from nothing uh, to being an important part of, of a particular niche of the, the international uh, legal education system in Asia. So it's been exciting. And the school has had longstanding ties to Alabama. You've sent interns here. You have relationships here. How did that begin? Well, uh, the, the Korean uh, diaspora, the Korean uh, corporations, of course, came to uh, Alabama with with Kia and and different different things, and the, uh, the 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 people in in Alabama, I think, in part because they uh, recognized the the importance of the ties that we can we can make when we uh, open up in some ways to, to other countries and other other places, welcomed our our students in. Uh, one of the, the neat things I see, because I, I travel around Asia a great deal, is there really is, across all countries and all cultures, of respect for the project of justice, the, the project of preparing people in principled ways to be advocates for others, to, to give advice uh, to others. And when you, you come and explain what your, your mission is in those terms, people get it. And whether it's in, in uh, going to a, a, a communist, still very communist country like Laos or, or going to a country like China or, or Mongolia, that project, that sense that all people share that we need justice and that schools that, that want to prepare people for that and, and bring the world together in that pursuit, whatever other problems we have, it's a, it's a message that works. It's sort of one of the, the basic ways in which I see the idea of, of natural law showing itself that, that God has put something in every heart that's universal. If you learn how to speak to that, uh, you get a reception. And your curriculum includes American law, correct? Yeah, so our, our program is just, we follow exactly a U.S. legal curriculum, except at the end of it, we're really uh, preparing people in what would usually be your elective classes. It really is all going to international trade, international business, or to international human rights issues like religious freedom, a lot of our students, there's a lot of concern for the, the situation of children in, in Asia. There's a lot, been a lot of problems with that. And so uh, there is a, a great international movement of, of people who are looking at situations in different countries and saying, look, how can, we, how can we help deal with some of these problems? How can we 
a very basic thing we do is, you, I've done this, many of our faculty have done this. You go to another country and go, hey, you know, this other country did this, and this helped with the exploitation of, of children sexually in this country. Maybe you should take a look at this. And you know what? People don't want their kids to be exploited. And if you, if you work for that and you, you help share the, the data, share information on that, there's an incredible amount of good you can do, uh, not at the level of, of uh, you know, sort of coercive, you know, imperial brute force, but of sharing knowledge, sharing argument, sharing a passion for these things to other countries. And how long have you been dean now? I've been dean for 13 years. 13 years, wow. So I believe I first met you probably about 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, you were visiting uh, the Alabama Supreme Court. What, uh, what do you see as sort of the, the primary goal of your deanship? What is, what, what, what is your sort of missional purpose? Yeah. I think of, of the, the leadership that, that we provide um, in, in my ad administration uh, f is focused really on the, the character of the school first, which is um, we're a Christian school. And the, the, the fundamental question that I have to keep before our faculty and our students at all times is how is what we're doing giving glory to God? How are we obeying God? And we have a, a, a great example in Jesus Christ of what it means to love God and, and love our neighbor. And we want to make sure that, that the passion to do that is carried out in all things. And lawyers, I mean, at a basic level, we're, we're focused on arguing, we're focused on counseling. And there are really important ways that you can, you can understand the, the, the passion that an advocate has to bring from the example of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the way in which counseling has to be done, uh, not only to uh, sort of fulfill your charge, but also to serve the person that you're giving legal counsel to. The way that to be a good lawyer, you have to be a good person. Um, and so in, in everything, there, there's a very subtle problem that we have, which is there, there are very clear objective standards. You know, we need our students to master a set of material. It's, a, it's objective, there's a global standard for it, we've got to do it. But you can't make that the enemy of the, the passion to become a Christ-like person, or to, to put it more, more broadly, in, in everything that, that we do as people, there needs to be this, this power, this, this passion that transforms what you're doing according to a, a divine order which gets beyond the things that corrupt us and bring us down. So the, the hardest and the most central thing is keeping our, our focus on that, and that's in recruiting students, I just have to tell students that vision, and make sure that's why they want to come to the school. And recruiting faculty, that's why you have to do it. And that, that's transformed our institution, I think, in, in really positive ways. And I, I should mention the staff, too. We, we want everybody in the school focused on that powerful vision. And uh, it changes things. Uh, because I can tell students, look, you begin this life in Christ as a lawyer now the way you treat students, and the way you treat faculty, and the way you treat staff, and the energy you put into your studies. Uh, as a faculty and staff, we, we gather together around that, that vision, wanting to glorify God, and it creates a different kind of institution. And it's an institution people love to be in, so they stay a long time. Because what, what people want to be doing in, in life, and in my humble estimation, of course, you need to take care of your family, you need to earn a living, but what, what people want is that great project of love, of justice, of knowing the divine. Um, so that's the, the big deal. And then, of course, a lot of the other things we have to do is, you know, there's the, the relentless building and construction of ever higher levels of standards of, of excellence and in instruction and in the day-to-day -day activities that you're, you're doing. And that, that presents a kind of pleasant tension because um, I think it was, it was Cicero who said, you know, the, the basic problem of, of prudential judgment is how you maintain the highest standards of honor and the highest standards of practicality. And people typically want to take them one way or another. They want to say, we need to sacrifice everything for honor or we need to sacrifice everything for practicality. 
And Cicero said, I think quite rightly, the, the whole reason for the, the orator, for the, the person who's helping in deliberations, the whole reason why he's a great person is if he can hold those things together. If he can show people uh, the, the practicality of honor and the honor of practicality in the way that serves both together. You grew up in Missouri. Surely you did not envision life in <laughs> South Korea when you were a young child. Tell me about your childhood and your story up until college. You went to Yale University, so, but tell, tell us sort of a little bit about growing up um, before, before the college experience. Yeah, I'm a, a uh, Missouri uh, uh, patriot, you might say. I, I love Missouri. And uh, I went away to the, the East Coast, Yale University, for, for school, and I was appalled. I hated it. Right? Very different culture than the culture I grew up with. Uh, very smart people, but people who have, have, have cut themselves off from what I think is the, the real fabric uh, that has made America great, uh, the real theological traditions. Yale was founded as this sort of marginal, extreme uh, religious school. And of course, uh, like a lot of higher education, it's drifted from that. Anyway, I, my, I met my wife uh, in high school in, in Missouri. Uh, she went to, to school on the East Coast too. And, and our basic reaction was, we wanna go back to Missouri, raise a family, live with our, our people there. Uh, we realize how important the, the place that we have at, at home is, and we wanna enrich that, that culture. And uh, I think we were right to, to have that view. But a really important part of, of my life was as I was, as I was seeking to do all those things and growing in my faith in Christ and, and learning more about, about uh, how I could help and how I, I couldn't, um, I received a really strong calling from God. And I, it's, uh, it, it's hard to explain, it's a long story, but, but I felt like God made it clear to me that this, this call that we got from Korea, I was involved in some Christian organizations and they were founding this new law school, international law school. And uh, my practice was in international intellectual property law. And so they saw the international on my name and I was involved in the Christian Legal Society and they got a hold of me. And I thought it was uh, a project that was wholly alien to what I'd wanted, which was to sort of go back home, to, you know, to be in my, my community. It was the exact opposite of any of my, my plans. And God really had to do some heavy pounding to get me off of that. Um, but I've come to see over, over the years how much of a, a natural e extension of that that, it, that was, that the, uh, the way in which God had used that first part of my life to prepare, be, prepare me to do something radically different and being open to that was incredibly important. So I, I guess m my life, uh, thus far has been a real example of the ways in which we, we need to be open for that kind of transformation. And I don't think it would have worked if I had done it for my personal, because it was gonna be a, a job where I made a lot more money or, or this kind of thing. It worked because for all those years, I'd been, been really thinking hard about how to serve people, about how to strengthen my family, about, uh, what it was God wanted me to do. And so when God wanted to present me with what I think is really the great, the great project of my life, which is to go and support this international law school, which is the only Christian international law school in, in Asia, the only Christian law school in Asia, um, which has been able, I think, in certain ways to, to transform some of the legal communities in, in Asia, I just wouldn't have been ready for that if I hadn't been trying to grow into my roots. I wouldn't have been able to, to hear that call from God and, and go and do these things. And there's a, there's a mystery in that and, and all sorts of things, but I guess the, the, the broad lesson I would take from, from my experience is, uh, you know, grow deep roots where, where you are. And what you'll, what you'll find at some point is that you are, uh, you are you're pointed in ways that you don't expect to go and to be ready for that. After 20 plus years mm. in Korea, do you now feel that it is your home? You probably feel that Missouri is always going to be your home, but do you feel at home 
in Korea as well. Yeah, one of the, uh, one of the, it's almost put ironically in the Christian scriptures, is that um, as you as you grow and develop, you should feel less and less at home anywhere, because you should feel more and more that your home is with God and within the heavenly kingdom. And um, you can read those words, and it's, it's hard to fathom. It, it, it certainly doesn't mean that everybody needs to move to Korea. It doesn't mean that everybody in the world needs to flip-flop spaces with, with other people. Uh, but it, it does mean that, that everybody has to, to develop a way of being where you are, which is also a way of life with God. And that's going to look differently for, for different people. The advantage of moving to another country is it forces upon you a sense of distance from the world. It is it, it, what the, the, the metaphor, so to speak, in what the scriptures teach, that we all need to be less at home in the world and more at home in, in heaven, is forced upon you in a literal kind of way. And it, it makes you see uh, certain ways that you're too attached to things, that you, you have become too at home in the world. And it's painful. And uh, I think everybody who's moved away from home has some sense of that, of that pain. But it can also be part of a, a really important spiritual process. So I love Korea. I love Missouri. Um, in one sense, I, I feel more at home in both of them. I'm, I'm home for a vacation right now. I'm so happy to be back in, in uh, visiting in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm, I'm from before I came down here. Um, but also, I'm, I'm more at home at both places and less at home at both places because all of us want to find a way in, in their life of, of aiming and serving at God. When you find that, you're more at home and you're less at home. And uh, that's a certain peace that I guess I've found with the, the situation. What are some of the chief differences in the way business is done in Korea versus in the United States? maybe just cultural distinctions and what elements of Korean culture might be sort of beneficial for Americans to take a look at? I mean, there, on, on, the, on the big levels, the relationship between government and business is much, much tighter in Korea than in the, the United States, um, particularly through its developmental phases. Business was really uh, managed in partnership with uh, the government. There was much, much more leadership. Uh, that's been starting to change somewhat, but there's uh, still in, in societies like Korea, which are fairly homogenous, there's a, a lot more uh, direct kind of cooperation between the, the government. That makes it harder. I mean, everybody should just be aware of that because if you're doing business with, with Korea, you're dealing business with a, a, a kind of group a more of a, a group that is different than the way business is done in the, the United States. Um, I think seeing how, how business is done in, in Asia makes you aware of the real problems for, for uh, long-term penetration and, and cooperation in those markets because they, they really are, are different. Uh, on the whole, I, I think uh, the Korean society is a wonderful society very moral society, uh, a society that, that organizes itself around um, respect, very respectful treatment of, of people. Uh, it's a society where the, the moral spirit of the, of the people permeates the institutions. And in, in my experience, this wasn't in business so much as in, in law firms, uh, we've lost some of that. Not that people were unethical, I think American lawyers are very ethical, um, but they weren't animated by this sense of commonality and togetherness and, and project. And that can be a downside. And this is a well-known well -known problem. If, you, if you're uh, working around these, these ideas of respect and uh, group characteristics, it puts some pressure on, on individuals to conform in different ways that can be, be problematic. Uh, as Aristotle would say, you know, we're probably looking for a mean. We're probably looking for something that is a, a mean between the extremes. And having some familiarity with the, the way that a modern economy can be uh, managed and run consistently 
with a, a stronger sense of the unity of, of society uh, without, without sacrificing many of the advantages that you have from individuality and individual rights and expression. Uh, that's a really important experience. If we walk out the doors to this building, we're on the Montgomery campus of Troy University. There are four, four campuses throughout mm -hmm. the state, but there are a lot of young people walking around outside right now who may not know what it is that they want to do with their lives. You've already imparted so much wisdom during this interview, but I wonder what you would say to those students about a sense of calling. You, you mentioned that you felt a, a sense of calling about going to Korea and about becoming a faculty member. You mm. had no idea at the time that you would become dean of the law yep. school, but what would you say to those students who are sort of unsure about the future and what they want to do for a living and how to make meaning out of their lives? I think you, you find your calling in life by wor wherever you are right now, uh, pursuing excellence in what you're doing and realizing that, that there, are, there are so many levels of excellence Excellence will always draw you up to a higher level. And it is, it's by following those, those different levels, by becoming great at what you're doing right now, and then seeing what next step takes you to. Uh, and that doesn't, that the, the, the way in which you're, you are, are led into a strong sense of calling in life is not by being 15 and saying, I wanna be an aerospace engineer the way you're, you're led into a calling is when you're 15 playing baseball really hard or playing chess really hard or playing golf really hard by studying grammar, history, English. And those things will draw you into the next stage of, of excellence. If, you wanna, if, you, if you're a person who says, I don't have a calling, how, how much are you studying in your history class? How much are you studying in your English class? How much passion are you giving to the things that are before you? Give passion to those things and they'll lead you to the next thing. And where it leads you, at least in, in my case, is totally unpredictable. When I was in law school, I didn't like international law. I didn't like intellectual property law. I became an international intellectual property lawyer. Um, when I was uh, you know, working as, as an attorney, I wanted to live in St. Louis, Missouri. I live in Pohang, Korea. Um, at each stage, what, what marked the, the difference was finding something that I could do and doing it with all my passion. Christians say, you know, work at what you're doing, but work as if you're working for the Lord. And that's, if you want guidance, if you want divine guidance, if you want a sense of divine direction in your life, you've got to be working up to God. You've got to be doing everything you're doing for the Lord. And when you do that and you keep pushing yourself, you find transformations in what you're doing. And this is a, a very old way of, of putting it, is we, we, we come from God and we are drawn back to God. And God draws us back to him by various kinds of excellences, by various kinds of, of goods. And that's how I'd, without going on too long, that's how I'd say you find your sense of, of calling. Well, there's a lesson in your story about thinking you know what you want for your life and then getting something that is different from what you wanted, but discovering that it is possibly even better than what you wanted. Absolutely. Uh, and yet, going through that process, like thinking about what it was, why we liked Missouri better than Connecticut, was a really important part of preparing us to move to Korea. Uh, really being passionate about working for the good of our, of our home town and state was what made it possible for us to want to work well for the good of the legal community in Asia. Um, and, and ultimately, a lot of what we mean by having a sense of calling is just as you, as you move up in your sense of what motivates you, you, when you get to a point where you say, yeah, what I'm doing right now is motivated by my best understanding of what is good, of what is right, of what is divine. That's what it means to have a sense that, hey, I'm doing what I'm called to do. When I get up in the morning, what I work on is something in which I can express all of my passion for what is good and right and just and pure and honorable. That's what you want. Well, how do you get there? You, you've, you've got to work for those things in whatever you're doing and, and find the opportunities to do it. You can do that. 
And this is where that, that, that union of practicality and honor that Cicero was talking about comes, comes together. Turns out, man is beautifully made in that when he is, uh, he is pursuing with all of his heart uh, the good of his neighbor, giving honor to God, he works really well. It's a really practical way to work. Life is a joy. And uh, again, how do you get there? Whatever you're doing right now, do it with all of your heart as for the Lord. Well, I certainly feel blessed by uh, your friendship, and I look forward to Likewise. your annual visits and our dinners. Uh, I've enjoyed cultivating a friendship with you over the years, and I really appreciate your time and coming on the show with us today. Folks, this has been an episode of Success Stories. Our guest today was Dean Eric Inlow. He's Dean of Handong International Law School in South Korea and also Vice President of Handong University. Dean Inlow, thank you very much. I wish you safe travels home. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.